I'm Chris Hill. Welcome to Motley Fool Tech Weekly, joined by Eric Bleeker and Jason Moser. A um, lot of people looking to get into the living room, the battle for the living room. Intel? Intel yeah. getting into the television space? I, 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 I don't want to argue with the success Intel has had in its business over the last 30 years, but that seems like kind of a big leap. Yeah, that battle for the living room, which just never kind of happens. But actually, Intel's making a lot of the progress here, and basically they want to do a uh, box that goes over the top, as we hear, and they want to offer their own, basically they want to offer cable packages. It's really instructive to actually watch because it shows you what's going on with Apple TV. A lot of people go, hey, Apple, get your button gear, where's your TV? It's, it's not that Apple doesn't have the platform to do it. It's that the content is so tough to get because cable companies love being bundled. Um, they love the rates that they get, and they're very averse to any kinds of change. So, I mean, some of the stats here, this is a report out of Reuters. They have deals with CBS, Viacom, and News Corp, but only for certain pieces of content. And the companies that are willing to work with them, they want a 50% to 75% uh, increase in what's paid right now to cable companies. So like, let's say Time Warner, they pay about $5, $5 plus for ESPN per month. That's mm -hmm. what subscribers ends up paying. If you're paying 75% on top of that, that gets really heady. But then you have to remember ESPN has essentially locked in 6.5% annualized increases into the latter half of the decade. Under that kind of payment plan an Intel would have to work with, each subscriber is paying just for ESPN alone 13 bucks. So by the time you even bundle like 10 of these channels, you might be paying more than a package that right now you already pay, you know, for 100 plus channels. And we see why it's so hard to break up this industry and they've got so much power. Apparently Intel keeps getting pushed further and further back on pricing. And they're kind of positioning it as not even a cord cutting, but a premium experience. And it's like, oh, the other shoe drops. This is not going to work. Because that's, that's not what a lot of consumers are interested in. And, and you know, you might be able to get away with a premium thing that's over the top if you've got a really great UI on it and you let that magical app world build upon itself. But, you know, Intel won't have that. They might be able to get a few major partners on. But look at the evolution of the App Store from when it was launched to today and look at what's on the top, you know. It's, it's really about letting millions of developers go to work and build on that. And with TV, once you've got that big of a canvas and you've got controllers and the iPad and iPhone, that's what makes the idea of an Apple TV special. So with Intel, you've got work for content deals, but it's going to be expensive. It's going to be aimed at the wrong market. Doesn't seem to work, but again, instructive to see what Apple's up against. It also seems like for m most other consumer spaces. We talk about costs coming down for consumers. We talk about uh, consumers are the big winner, you know, in smartphones, you know, because they have more choices, etc. But when we talk about cable, it just seems like the consumers are still in the same spot they were 10, 20 years ago, which is, uh, maybe it's overstating it to say we're at the mercy of the cable companies, but the whole notion of, of choice and a la carte really has never developed. No, and I mean, that's why I think we need to watch what Intel is doing here and learn from it, because it's neat to have sort of that idea of being able to just pick and choose what channels or bundles of channels you want and and pay for that bundle. But but for what Intel's trying to offer, I mean, the, the proposition requires that it be less expensive than what you're doing now, right? Otherwise, why would you switch? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I am a little bit less sympathetic to these people that gripe about cable companies. I mean, I understand that maybe you don't like the fact that you pay for all of these channels that you don't necessarily watch, but seriously? I mean, who cares? It's like 100 bucks a month, 120 bucks a month. You're getting all these channels. You get your, your HBO, your Amazon Prime, your Netflix, Netflix, any other way you want to watch, anything you want to watch. I mean, this is like a real third world problem, isn't it? First world. Well, yeah, that, that was the point, exactly. Um, and so, I mean, it's just one of those things where I feel like, okay, it's great to watch sort of the evolution of this market, but at the same time, I don't get too terribly worked up over it because at the end of the day, no matter what, to, to get any of this stuff, you need to have a cable connection to your house to get that internet, right? I think that's a really valid point, too. You look at studies that show how much people sleep and watch TV and you go, when is anyone working? Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. I've seen things as high as 34 hours a week watching TV on average, and you do an adjusted value of entertainment relative to what you pay on cable, and it's a really stellar deal. Now, that being said, why is it not changing? Well, regulatory is one big mm -hmm. deal. So, you know, you, 
you just look at that and you start to realize why this industry could be really special. And the point I like to make, the global music industry is worth $16 billion. That's, that's about how much, you know, artists and everything. But Apple took the idea of music, something deeply personal to people, they get a lot of enjoyment out, turned into being worth a couple hundred billion dollars to them because they controlled a higher value thing, which was the hardware. You look at TV and the value in that, if you can control the platform over that, think of the kind of value generation you can make. So you see all these analysts trying to, you know, model in precisely Apple gets this much of the market and everything, but it's about, you know, being able to keep people in iOS, driving other devices that would be able to function within a television, and being able to control uh, media that sells, you know, you buy a season of a TV show for $40 versus a song for a buck, you know. It's, it's, it's tremendously powerful, and I don't know what the final way of working with these companies will be, but I think giving Apple a little patience on this makes a lot of sense because people want it now, but we see with Intel how entrenched it is. If you're an Intel shareholder though, are you excited about this move or are you looking at them saying, stick to your knitting, stay with chips? I would say stick to your knitting, stay with chips. All right, let's, <laughs> let's talk about chips then. Um, uh, some people out there asking the question, you know, their latest line of chips, their new line, possibly even re being so good it revives the PC industry. Yeah, no, it's, it's Haswell. It's a lineup that we've been looking forward to for a long time because, you know, Intel's kind of taken a step back and said, we're so concerned about performance, performance, performance. And meanwhile, underneath them was basically Qualcomm and all the ARM-based people saying, power efficiency, and all of a sudden, we, again, we talk about total mo computing devices, including mobile, and all of a sudden this ARM industry has gone very influential. So we look at Intel, and they kind of went back to the drawing board a little bit. Haswell, the newest chip lineup, focuses on power efficiency. There's a new MacBook Air out, which isn't going to blow you away. It looks like the old ones. But then you turn on, it's running the Haswell chip, 13 hours of battery life in most tests. All of a sudden, the PC is just as power efficient as a tablet. And yeah, it's gonna be a more expensive, but I think all of a sudden it reduces a lot of the reason people were moving to uh, tablets in the first place. And it, it highlights a broader theme that, again, we don't need to really look between tablets and PCs. And some Microsoft has right in theory in Windows 8, which is basically the form factor is gonna converge. And I can't even imagine this thing is terrible. <laughs> this thing is really bad. Why we would ever need you know PCs uh, with optical drives, let alone, uh, you know, hard disk drives in the future, just because once you start using something that's um, staying on for 13 hours a day, it just feels like 90% of the consumer market's going to gravitate there. Yeah, I think the form factor point's a really good one. My wife has one of those uh, MacBook Airs, and I'm just floored by how small and sleek it is. And, I mean, you can cart it anywhere. It's like an iPad, essentially, and it seems about the same weight and I mean, I think that's the one big hang up with tablets at this point is it's a little bit more difficult to get your work done on them, mm -hmm. right? But a laptop offers you that, that functionality. And so form factor, I think, is going to be a big deal going forward. And these new chips can offer us that type of, of extended battery life. Well, I think it's a huge win. It can certainly, it certainly shortens our, our we're, we're not going to be able to really argue the demise of the PC uh, so, so simply, I think. Uh, let's wrap up with telecoms uh, reports last week of AT&T um, uh, kicking the tires of Telefonica to the tune of $93 billion. Yeah. Um, is, is, are we about to see, uh, if not uh, a lot of consolidation, certainly some sort of uh, spending spree going on in the telecom world? Well, and I, I talked about earlier chip consolidation uh, processors that's essentially moved down to four companies because it's so expensive to go down to the next level of technology. Well, wireless companies, it's so expensive coming up towards LTE. We've seen T-Mobile lag in that respect, and we see an investment from SoftBank in Sprint, and what's that gonna go towards? Building out the network. And the table stakes of telecom are outrageous. You see Verizon and AT&T pouring forth, you know, around 20 billion in capital expenditures a year. So I think consolidation in the industry makes a lot of sense. It, it definitely seems like some that will continue being fewer players. And another point to that, well, in the U.S., I think net subscriber ads was only 2% year over year. There's just not a lot more people to sell to. So it makes sense. AT&T, Verizon, they've got shareholders. You know, they want their dividends, but people also want some kind of growth 
out of it. So you look overseas and you maybe look at companies that aren't being optimally run. And I think this is exactly what they're doing. And yet, when we were talking earlier about uh, the cable industry and Eric uh, raised the specter of regulatory concerns that get raised, it's hard for me to believe that any kind of significant consolidation can take place without U.S. regulators, if not stopping a deal altogether, at least affecting it. Well, we're definitely going to see at least some concerns there. I mean, you just look at something like, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a different example, but just the Google Ways deal where the FTC is getting involved there because right. of you know, antitrust concerns. So no doubt consolidation in this sector is going to bring that, bring that argument up. But I mean, at the end of the day, really, I mean, we're going to mobile. Eric mentioned all of the money that these companies are investing in their wireless uh, departments here. It's, it's just all about the data, right? I mean, now you get a smartphone and the calling function is essentially just that's just sort of a byproduct of the phone. They want to get you reeled in on that data plan because the more data they can feed us, the more data we use, the more money they're going to make. Uh, you think any of these deals take place before the end of the year or are they still going to be circling one another and, and maybe it's 2014 before we see any kind of significant deal making in telecom? I think there's a lot of circling. I think Verizon needs to figure out its Vodafone problem that Verizon Wireless is a 55% Verizon, 45% uh, Vodafone area. We've seen talk about this for so long. I think people have fallen asleep on it, but it, it constantly gets revived. So before we see some serious deal making from Verizon, I think they're starting to look internally and saying, what are we going to do about this JV? All right. For Eric Bleeker and Jason Moser, I'm Chris Hill. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.